Hey y'all, it's Becky here from The Becky Sphere, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Becky, and every Tuesday and Thursday, yes, I know it's Wednesday, I was late this week, I'm sorry, we talk about the climate here, the problems, yes, but the solutions, yes. So if that sounds like something you would be interested in, go ahead and click that subscribe button below, click the like, comment, share, all that good stuff, and today we will talk about offshore wind. So there's two types of offshore wind. There's the fixed offshore wind, which is basically offshore wind turbines that are fixed all the way into the ground. And then there are floating offshore wind, which are turbines that are on a floating platform that is then uh, anchored to the ground. Now, as of now, there's only fixed offshore wind farms. And that is because the floating offshore wind is about five to seven years behind in the way of uh, technological innovation. But it's actually predicted by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a laboratory under the Department of Energy. They predict that floating offshore wind will actually become the more dominant form than the fixed. And the reason why that is, is because fixed offshore wind only really works up to about 60 meters of depth. Past that, it's too deep for them to bother trying to get all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And that is where floating comes in. Now, if you were to look at a map of just the coastlines in the US, there is a lot more opportunity for floating turbines, specifically in the Pacific, because in California and in um, the Pacific Northwest, the depth along the coastline drops pretty quick. So as a result, it will be more useful for places such as off the coast of California to utilize offshore wind if it were floating. But that's also why the only offshore wind farms that are located off the US coast is in Rhode Island area because of a more gradual depth transition. And in both cases, both of them, uh, to get electricity to the main grid, puts a wire all the way down and dug into the bottom of the sea floor to head over to the coast. Now this might sound very invasive, but keep in mind that offshore drilling has been doing this same kind of thing for a long time. In fact, offshore wind technology has derived a lot of its uh, form from what we know from offshore drilling. That being said, a lot of offshore drilling companies, a lot of fossil fuel companies, are starting to move on the offshore wind technology because it is already in their wheelhouse and it will provide jobs therefore for those who are used to working in the offshore drilling sort of environment. It is projected that there will be about 76,000 to 80,000 jobs created by 2030 according to the the NREL. Offshore wind is expected to move from its experimental phase to its utility scale usage phase by 2024, which is very exciting because in addition to that, they also predict that the prices because of new technological innovation and competition, as well as government subsidies will draw the price down for um, this energy form for a fixed price to five cents per watt by 2025 and for floating six cents by 2030. Overall, we've already seen the cost for this form of energy fall 70%. Another method that will make things more cost effective and also produce more energy is the increased size of these wind turbines. And right now, the, the wind turbines, I believe, produce 10 megawatts of energy 
per turbine and as you increase the size of the turbines and also as you increase the how far out it is in the ocean hence the benefit of floating turbines we are going to see more energy production possible per turbine right now the 12 uh, megawatt turbine by GM already in the works and one 12 megawatt turbine is has enough power to power 4,000 to 4,500 homes which is a lot <laughs> so that's pretty cool that's just one the NREL presentation that I watched which was in March of 2020 he predicted that there will eventually become a 15 megawatt turbine available. In fact, it might actually kind of subsidize the um, onshore capabilities because more wind tends to actually blow at night. So where solar and onshore wind might drop off, offshore wind might pick up, at least in the coastal areas but the coastal areas in the US represent 40% of the US population. So that is definitely something. And that's also not including the Great Lakes, which is another location that offshore wind is being considered. After all, Chicago is called the Windy City. Another benefit of offshore wind in comparison to onshore wind, which I will do a video about later, um, is that offshore wind doesn't have to deal as much with on land transportation of these giant mechanisms so instead they just build them on port and ship them off coast now obviously the fact that they are off the coast means that transportation to get over to those wind farms is more expensive usually it either takes ship or helicopter and there also does need to be a lot of maintenance because sea salt is erosive. However, through technolog technological development from offshore drilling and also just from ships, we have learned pretty well how to develop technology in a way that is relatively resistant to salt water erosion. Now, I'm not gonna lie, the initial technological build of these offshore wind farms is very expensive but with increased technological um, development and just within a couple years those wind farms can pay themselves back now with all that said it's a little weird to me that literally this month I found this article and this article is so hmm is so frustrating that we're going to dive into it and pick through it because I want to and it frustrates me. Let's get right into that article, shall we? I'm going to read the full article and critique it as I go. I'm sure I'm going to trim parts so that it isn't having to read the full article because you don't need to read the full article. But it's called Offshore Wind Plans Will Drive Up Electricity Prices and Require Massive Industrialization of the Oceans by Robert Bryce. And this is in Forbes, February 5th. The regatta for setting the loftiest targets for offshore wind energy development has set sail. Today, South Korea announces plans for an 8.2 gigawatt of offshore wind. Oh, this part's actually good to know, like they're, he, he does give the latest news updates for what is happening with offshore winds, so there's that. Today, South Korea announces plans for an 8.2 gigawatt of offshore wind. Prime, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson recently called for 40 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity to be built on the UK waters by 2030. If achieved, it would be one of the biggest British maritime developments since the Battle of Trafalgar's tar. Sorry. Meanwhile, the European Union has targeted some than 300 gigawatts of offshore capacity by 2050. Joe Biden's climate advisors are calling for the immediate approval of a slew of pending offshore wind projects. In New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo is calling for nine gigawatts of offshore wind capacity to be built by 2035. Other East Coast governors are also floating multi-gigawatt offshore plans. 
in all, according to a report issued by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, also known as BOEM, last June, approximately 22 gigawatts of Atlantic offshore wind development are reasonably foreseeable along the East Coast. And again, this is not even talking about the newer technology of floating offshore wind, which will then increase the opportunities. As of now, there are about 15 leases, I believe, of offshore wind projects that are being prepared. Something that's funny is, okay, so one of Biden's main plans is to uh, double offshore wind, right? I don't know whether or not he's referring to what we currently already have built, in which case that would be two farms <laughs> instead of one. Or if he's referring to all the lease projects, which could then be from 15 leases given, or I guess if you include the other one, then 16 to 32, which is a much bigger endeavor. So I'm not sure what he was referring to. I'm guessing it's the latter, but I just found that funny. I was like, oh, so two farms, okay. <laughs> Here's some advice. Take all of these offshore plants with a large grain of sea salt. The history of offshore wind in domestic waters is, repl is replete with cancel plans. Yes, Cape Wind, I'm talking about you. Cost overruns, cabling problems, and permit delays. Furthermore, offshore wind continues to be one of the most expensive forms of electricity generation. That high is that high priced use will cost taxpayers untold billions of dollars over the coming years. That means higher cost electricity for low and middle income consumers. And higher income, I'm not sure why he specified that was just lower and middle income consumers. And also, didn't we just discuss that um, it's projected that in four years, offshore wind for fixed is going to end up being five cents and this was from a department of energy laboratory that said it during the trump administration hmm Finally, building gigawatt scale offshore wind will be lousy for the oceans, navigation, and marine life. The forecast build out for offshore wind in the US will require industrializing vast swaths of some of the most heavily fished and navigated waters in North America. It will require anchoring thousands of offshore platforms along the eastern seaboard, which could interfere with marine mammal migration and wreck navigational havoc during a hurricane, major storm, or oil spill. It will also add yet more noise pollution to the already noisy ocean. Fossil fuels are causing all these problems too, so I'm not sure why there's a double standard between renewable energy options and fossil fuels. It's interesting how convenient it is to completely forget about all those negative impacts when we're looking at fossil fuel industries. And in addition to that, I'm not quite sure how a heavily fished side of the ocean has really much of anything to do with the development of offshore wind. That sounds like fisheries need to work on that. Which they can't fish in areas of offshore wind, I'm just saying. But another interesting thing is that we have seen from offshore drilling sites that life grows around those platforms. There's been unforeseen benefits of certain um, ecosystems being able to grow amongst the um, development of offshore infrastructure. So that's an unforeseen benefit. And also there, a study recently came out that suggested that in fact, offshore wind farms might be able to decrease the amount of wind intensity of an upcoming hurricane, kind of creating a natural barrier for the coastline and it will increase the communication infrastructure along the ocean to be able to predict earthquakes. So that's another unforeseen possible benefit. Now, one thing that I do agree in this is that more research does need to be done in regards to offshore winds environmental impact. 
Right now, there's very little research that's done, and that's because of how new the technology is overall. As we continue to look into making more offshore wind farms, we are going to need to do more environmental impact assessments to make sure that we are not just screwing a already hurt ocean. So that is something I do agree with. Before delving into those issues, it's worth remembering why offshore wind has become such a priority for states like New York. The answer is simple. Rural New York is in a full-scale uprising that is halting the growth of several proposed solar and wind projects. In 2018, Ann Reynolds, an executive director for the Alliance of Clean Energy in New York, explained why the backlash is occurring. Quote, I personally think the, argument, the arguments against wind energy are because people don't want to see the turbines. So many rural New Yorkers don't want to see turbines that state officials in Albany are in the process of stripping local governments of their home rule authority over the approval and sitting of renewable projects. Just for a moment, imagine if the state government was doing the same for oil and gas drilling. If that would happen, perhaps the New York Times would cover the backlash against wind in New York. My dude, um, can you please tell me uh, which communities next to fossil fuel industries approved to have their area polluted? What are you talking about, my dude? Have you looked at the history? I'm just saying there are many times when certain governments, whether or not it's local, state, or federal governments, have chosen to put fossil fuel plants over in disadvantaged communities because those communities did not have a voice in the, in the discussion. And also, why are people complaining so much about what wind farms look like? I kind of think they're cute. They're kind of like back to the prairie sort of days. I'm not sure why there's a complaint there. I digress. And also, the, the sass that he has in this article, it makes me think that this unbiased journalist, journalist is a little biased towards this topic. With surging friction onshore, the renewable industry wants to set anchor in salt water, but that effort has been met with fierce headwinds. Okay, this part, too many offshore puns. Too many. With surging friction onshore, the renewable industry wants to set anchor in salt water, but that effort has been met with fierce headwinds. Over the last two decades, numerous offshore projects, including the ill-fated 468 megawatt Cape Wind project, have been scuttled, delayed, blown off course, or abandoned. In California, New York, Massachusetts, and other coastal states, the sitting approval process has been protracted and often hinges around the condition that if built, the giant seabird killing machines, the giant seabird killing machines will not be visible from beachfront Swanakitas Swan in Malibu, Maltok, and Hillsonport. Okay, what the actual, calling them just straight up without any other context, giant seabird killing machines. I don't care if you say that they are killing seabirds, but give me data to back it up. You cannot just put that in people's heads and be considered a good journalist. I'm just saying that is biased AF. Not, not cool. And also, I think we just said something about how there really isn't that much evidence one way or another in regards to environmental impact. So you kind of jump to conclusions there, man. The Hills and Ports story is instructive. In 2001, the backers of Cape Wind filed their first permit application. It would become one of the most contentious energy projects of any kind in U.S. history. The backers of Cape Wind filed their first permit applications in 2001. Wait, you just repeated that. Despite getting environmental approvals for, from the federal government the back, and the backing of many elected officials in Massachusetts, the project faced enormous opposition, including from Robert F. Kennedy Jr., whose family owns a modest compound in Hillsonport. Cape Wind was officially deep-sixed in 2015. Since then, Massachusetts legislators have floated a plan to increase the offshore target to 5.6 gigawatts, or roughly a dozen projects 
uh, the size of the scuttled Cape Wind. So it seems like a combination of public opinion and lack of government support is the main cause of it. So if we are now moving towards more renewable energy options and we have a president and many other people in government that support moving towards renewable energy, I'm not sure that this example would happen again. The only offshore wind project in the US is the Block Island project off the coast of Rhode Island. That project began producing power in 2017. But significant problems have already emerged and the owners of the 30 megawatt project have been forced to shut the turbines down while contractors rebury the power cable that brought the juice to shore. The initial phase of reburying it will total more than $30 million. Orsted, the company that is now own, that now owns the project, has refused to disclose the total cost of the cable reburying effort. Maintenance will need to happen. That's normal and I'm pretty sure they're back up and running now. The high cost of offshore wind will impose a regressive tax on low and middle income consumers. An economist, Jonathan Lesser, points out in the New York Post last year, the electricity to be produced from two of the projects being slated for New York waters, Empire Wind and Sunrise Wind, will cost about $100 per megawatt hour. That's high price juice, particularly when you consider that the average cost of wholesale electricity in New York in 2019, according to the New York Independent Systems Operator, was about $33, a record low. Now, I did a little research on your economist. You're from the same institute, the Manhattan Institute, which has a lot of interesting ties towards fossil fuel industries. And if you look at some of Lesser's other projects, other articles that he has produced, he is very clearly against renewable energy in general. So low-key, I'm not sure that he's the best economist for this, especially since he's going against what we have already talked about with the NREL, which predicts that the price is going to be as low as five cents for a fixed offshore wind by 2025. The potential impact for American offshore is also gobsmackingly large. The US Gulf of Mexico, which is one of the most productive offshore drill and gas provinces on the planet, has about 1900 platforms. According to the October article in EE News, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia have set goals for offshore wind totaling some 28.5 gigawatts and another 7.5 gigawatts is being targeted. If those states want 36 gigawatts of capacity, it will require installing about 3,600 offshore platforms. Thus, if the offshore wind promoters have their way, the eastern seaboard alone could be carpeted with nearly twice as many offshore platforms as now are in the Gulf of Mexico. The ocean's big, my dude. I'm just saying. You're trying to scare us by being like, the ocean's going to be covered with offshore wind. But... The ocean's big. One of the leases will put a dozen wind turbines smack on top of one of the best scallop and fishery, squid fisheries in the eastern seaboard. Numerous groups, including the Fisheries Survival Fund, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association, as well as the Bone Knackers, a small group of fishermen whose roots in Long Island go back centuries, are intermittently proposed to wind projects slated for the region. Yeah, of course they are and some people are going to get upset moving to renewable energy, that's how it is. But also, current use of certain water locations is definitely put into consideration when choosing sites. On Friday morning, Vaughn Brandy, the executive director for the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association and a board member for the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, told me that the long-term environmental impacts of proposed projects isn't well understood. That's true. Quote, we know that these giant machines change wind patterns and they could change marine migration patterns. Let's do the science before we destroy the ocean and our ocean food supply. 
Once again, kind of ironic considering how many oil and gas drilling sites are already out there. And climate change. The draft environmental impact statement for Virginia Wind, which was released in June, said, quote, major direct impacts of na navigation could occur due to the presence of structures needed for the project. It also said, quote, major effects could occur in commercial fisheries. Commercial fisheries need to be adapted anyway, because as you mentioned, overfished. Again, double standards. It's just <sighs> to understand what offshore wind juggernaut might mean for our oceans. I asked Jesse Aston Bell, director of the program for human environment at Rockefeller University, for a comment. In an email, Aston Bell told me that human that we humans are creating a fast-growing ocean of things that is populating the water column from floor to surface. He said that EU's plans for 300 gigawatts of wind capacity would, quote, alone require acreage of about 100,000 square kilometers or about two thirds of the surface of the Baltic or Black Sea, or a bit less than half of the land area of, the Brit of Great Britain press Ireland. He concluded, environmentalists have not yet grasped the massive industrialization of the oceans now underway and proposed. It's already been underway with many different reasons. And offshore wind is just one. In addition to that, if you look at offshore winds, they have to be spread apart for their giant turbines to work and for them not to impact each other. So even though the space allotted to an offshore wind farm might be huge, the actual amount of sea floor that is impacted by offshore wind on those sites is significantly less than the overall square acreage. So it's not like a huge blanket of offshore wind. That's, it's misleading. Back in 2011, Salazar declared that offshore wind was America's new energy frontier. A decade later, America's offshore wind potential is still just that potential. If offshore wind does achieve a huge expansion under Joe Biden, the invoice for that expansion will be equally huge and the price impacts will be felt most acutely by low and middle income Americans who will struggle to pay their electricity bills. Total fear mongering. Total fear mongering. You know what also costs a lot? Impacts of climate change. If the advisors on Biden's climate team are serious about protecting the environment, now would be a good time for them to reconsider the massive industrialization of the oceans that is now underway. It might even make them think about preventing America's existing fleet of nuclear reactors from being prematurely shuttered. So that goes to where he really, it really cares about, which is nuclear reactors. Which, while I do agree that nuclear reactors, and this is just gonna be a very short little thing, while I do agree that nuclear reactors should not necessarily be shut down if they are already created and producing energy because they are a good form of renewable energy, they are too costly and built too slow to be the main source of energy production when we're moving away from oil and gas. So I'm not sure what he's proposing for the solution to our current energy dilemma because nuclear ain't covering it. So anyways, I hope you found this interesting. I am now exhausted. And another thing that I want to add that he didn't is one of the things that I'm concerned about with offshore wind is because it is basically in the same wheelhouse as offshore drilling and so and it's and it is expensive to do it's not necessarily a community-based thing like solar and so there is definitely potential for monopolization from big oil companies who have kind of caused climate change to be able to make money through offshore wind that's my major concern because frankly i don't want to give them anything for the amount that they caused many to reiterate All right, I will talk to you all on Thursday with All We Can Save, which is right here, this beautiful book right here. Make sure you get your copy. Please join me for that live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So I would love to have you there. 
and remember to talk about the climate every day and support your local news organizations. All right, bye.